um, I always get thrown off that. Um, so we have a cold conference case presentation today. Um, this is going to be kind of in the more traditional style, at least to start, um, that goes along with this patient's presentation. Um, as we get further along, um, I'm not going to make you wait three weeks for serologies or other findings to come back. Um, but um, we will start with a, the chief complaint on presentation. This is a 79-year-old gentleman coming to Rack Clinic at the VA with his son, um, who says he's confused. What would you like to know? How long has this been going on? Yeah. Oh, and we can start the recently traveled stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. So, the son um, lives with his father, or his father more lives with his son, moved here from Wisconsin about six months, or no, about four months ago, and was completely normal at that time. Now, in the last two months, has become increasingly confused and had some falls at home. And this was like the first appointment he could get. They live in Colorado Springs. He is a veteran, seen by the VA um, in Wisconsin, just doesn't have a PCP here. So this is his first contact with the healthcare system since arriving in Colorado. Good question. Baseline. Um, so this is, again, a 79-year-old gentleman, um, lived in Wisconsin completely independently. Um, at first, when he moved in with his son, was completely independent. Uh, the son is in his 50s. His children have moved out. It's just he and his wife. They would go to work all day. Um, his dad would be fine at home alone, run errands, drive, um, and take care of all of his own business. Um, so again, like completely functionally independent, operating kind of at the highest functional status for a 79-year-old. Yeah, so now, um, and I'll highlight this entire conversation is between the son and the provider. Um, the patient is there um, and occasionally makes non sequitur remarks, but is not participating in the interview. Um, he, which is, again, very different from this baseline. Um, the son says, I didn't notice it at first. I thought, didn't think anything of it. Um, he was just like a little more tangential and like would tell me the same story again and again or not remember that we talked about an upcoming appointment, an upcoming plan to go out to dinner. Um, and then it, there were a couple incidents where he and his wife came home from work and the, the father was no longer at home and they had to call the police to find him. Um, and then other incidences of him um, having a couple of falls that he wasn't able to get up from. Um, he was seen in an emergency department, no fractures, no acute head injuries. Um, but the falls were something that he had never in his 79 years experienced previously. And it wasn't like tripping over a small dog, tripping over a coffee table, tripping over an un, uh, inappropriately loose rug. It was truly like spontaneous falls. And how much of it you guys know that's going to be teaching himself? Like, is he directly asking questions? Is he responding appropriately? He is oriented to self. Did this all, like, happen completely two months ago, or has it been two months over the last two months? Yeah, excellent question. So, um, again, the patient moved here from Wisconsin four months ago and was completely normal for the first two months. And then now, in retrospect, the son remembers uh, the first time, it was a couple months ago, for his wife's birthday, they had dinner plans, and he had to tell his dad, like, several times, and he just didn't remember it and was, like, surprised, um, and that was the first time, which was about two months ago, that the son can identify anything abnormal, and it's just been pretty rapidly progressive from there. And why do Very good question. Um, so, the son at first says, too much COVID time, which didn't which was interesting. Um, so on additional history, it sounds like the uh, patient has recently separated from his wife of about 60 years. 
um, with whom he was living in Wisconsin. Um, and in digging and asking, like, did she have complaints about behavioral changes, memory issues? The son says, no, my brother and I were surprised they didn't get divorced years ago, but after being together for six months with COVID, they couldn't stand each other anymore. They both came out here, he decided to stay, and she went home. This was, and this is just for a timeline, this is January of this year. So he moved out in October, it was normal for two months, became abnormal, and is now here. Um, and I'll say on additional substantiation, the wife agrees. Like she's like, he was a jerk, but there was nothing wrong with him. Or it, it wasn't even a jerk. I think they just didn't get along. Any depression or like mood issues after that? Excellent. And why are you asking about that? Just because especially in the elderly, elderly population, they can present more like neuroplanes or memory issues when they have to it. Wonderful. And I think that's a really important thing to highlight um, is, uh, as Dr. Martin's saying, in older populations especially, but in many different groups, um, depression can become a mimicker of psychosis or altered mental status. Um, and you can't right now complete any kind of screening like a PHQ-9 or anything like that. Um, but the son says, you know, he's he's been tough my whole life. He was always a hard worker, but there there's no history. He has no history of substance abuse um, and no no history of depression. Um, any other things, that, other thoughts or questions you might ask or ways to screen for depression or ask about things that might be concerning for depression? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and initially he was. He was going for walks and not getting lost. Um, had friends that he called, had been trying to reconnect with veteran friends that were in the area. Um, he was still eating the same, didn't have any weight loss. Yeah, sleeping. Um, so I feel like that's a pretty complete HPI. Are there other specific questions that you want to answer? Um, or what what should we what what do you want to know moving forward for this patient? Okay. Um, so I would say uh, various dimensions are very much on my differential. So I'm going to ask more ROS questions that may help stuff that out. Um, so thinking about like Parkinson's, has he had any tremor? Um, does he have, have you noticed like he's got more of a shuffling gait? Do you notice any slowing uh, of his movement? Uh, thinking about movie body, is he having any visual hallucinations? Just want to think that other people aren't noticing. Oh yes, sir. Oh, yeah, no, excellent. So I think really clearly starting to try and categorize what type of altered mental status we're dealing with. Um, that's kind of very clearly what's going on. And so in the category of dementia, getting a really complete review of systems, um, specifically um, Parkinsonian symptoms, he right now when he walks, he seems to walk okay. Um, and he was walking with the assistance of a walker. Um, but didn't have a wide base shuffling gait, um, no tremor in his movements either at rest or when he reaches for things in the room, um, can't really follow commands very well. Um, and Sun says that he never mentioned any um, hallucinations, specifically things like small animals or children. So they're like vascular risk factors or like weak, focal weakness, numbness, like incontinence or issues. Yeah. Um, a great question. So thinking more about like, again, a vascular cause. Um, so he does have a history of coronary artery disease. He had two stints in 2018, um, but no um, repeated hospitalizations for heart failure really hasn't been in a hospital since then. Um, he has diabetes as well. Um, his son thinks it's pretty well controlled. Um, what other questions? Any other questions? There. Um, oh, I think like FDH. Yeah. Um, incontinence. He actually, interestingly, with all of this, still like 
tends to let people know when he has to go to the restroom or gets the restroom on his own and can do that by himself. Um, he, um, yeah, and doesn't have, hasn't been saying any like weird statements, um, just doesn't seem to understand what's happening around him. Um, so kind of in an attempt to differentiate like frontotemporal dementia from, and disinhibition from just a no clear understanding of what's going on. Um, so I think this is one time where um, I don't always love mnemonics, but I think for altered mental, mental status, partially because I like the mnemonics, but partially um, because it actually is pretty helpful to work through, there are some mnemonics that can help. Do you guys have any that you use? Like some of those stupid ones. Yeah, and that's actually the one I, I like um, just because and as with anything, I think it's helpful to have a systematic approach. And we started to go through a lot of them. So, um, and we'll need um, additional information to follow up. But you guys know M? Um, Metabolic? Exactly. Um, so looking really at like BMP electrolytes, um, you can throw, yeah, BMP and electrolytes generally. Um, o, this is really the tricky one, I feel like sometimes. Yeah, oxygen, so hypoxemia um, is what we would find. V, we've talked about. Vascular. Vascular, excellent. Um, e. Is it alcohol or is that later? It, you, it's not, you can't mention alcohol too many times, so <laughs> I think alcohol absolutely as well as endocrine. Um, specifically like um, glucose dysregulation, thyroid, or any other like central process. Um, S. Great. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you're using it very well. Yeah, exactly. And I think again, it kind of does get through a lot of things. Um, you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Then you. The uranium. Yeah. Um, and then P. This is another one that's really broad and a little less maybe helpful. Again, I'm not going to just include any of these substances, but psychogenic. Yeah. Um, and then I. Infection. infection. But again, I think you like You're thinking cool. about injections frequently yeah. is not wrong. And then finally, D. Dementia. Dementia or drugs. Um, and then, yeah, so I think like making sure you get drugs, ingestion, intoxication, polysubstitute use in there. You think it counts for a lot of letters. Um, so I think. One comment on this. Yes, so please. I would say, um, good to see everybody again. Um, if you don't have a functioning structure, whether it's a mnemonic or not, uh, you need one by the end of intern year, uh, only because it, it's so easy to see how to get this wrong. When you're like, at some point you're like, uh, I don't know, it's drugs and stuff. Uh, and drugs and stuff is not going to get you very far, or it's going to get you really far with a $15,000 workup. Um, I pick one of these. There's the AEIOU tips. There's this one. Um, I don't know. There's probably as many as you can find. Yes. Yeah. Confused. Yeah. Uh, there are really, really long ones that are not particularly helpful, but you have to have one because they're just so easy to screw this up. So, exactly. You know, um, I also don't love mnemonics, but I love something, and this is probably the best something out there. Yeah, and this one it always this like condition. comes to my mind because they're either coming up because they're not moving right or they're acting stupid. And so I like it just kind of comes <laughs> to mind, and I'm like, oh, and you kind of systematically go through these things. Yeah, understanding we are entering your world, we well, can't say stupid. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. just to make some allowances, but uh, exactly. for now, I think this is as good as any. Um, so looking at this mnemonic, thinking about the very broad differential that we have, um. I think it's important, as Dr. Connors was hinting at, before we pursue a multi-million dollar workup in a 79-year-old gentleman, to evaluate like common causes being common um, and ordering our first kind of round of testing judiciously. 
So, and it's, I think the first way to say that is like, what on that list is most likely? And we have our future juristician here, so he will <laughs> be slapping our hands back as we reach for inappropriate intervention. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. So I, yes, again, I think in anyone who's confused, medications are really important, um, but especially in older patients. Um, as you all know, there's the beers list. Love the med rec. Yeah. And so I think the med rec would be an excellent place to start. Um, and for this patient, um, it was easy. The son had brought the medication and um, you were able to get it through the VA that it was, it matched up for once. Um, so this patient takes lisinopril 10, um, metoprolol is heart 25 BID, um, and it's not able to say like he's had some low blood pressures in the past, and so they had it BID, and if he didn't feel that he didn't have to take both both doses, but he usually takes both doses. Uh, metformin 1,000 BID, um, glargine 35 QHS, and sertraline 100. What do you guys think of the med list? You might have depression after all. Yes. Maybe he does. The son, the son says, oh, I, he told me that was for sleep. But absolutely. Um, I think that's an important highlight. Um, and unfortunately, I can't get records from the patient. And I did not spend the time to find out all of the story um, with the sertraline. But overall, are we more or less suspicious of a, suspicious of a medication causing this right now? Yeah, yeah, he, we don't, yeah. It's, how well controlled is this blood glucose? Is he having hypoglycemia? What's going on? Um, excellent. Okay, so what, um, what other low-hanging fruit is there on this? Um, differential to knock out. What do we need to be thinking about that we can't miss? Okay, like if he hasn't gotten a plain PP or any easy visits or falls, I mean, you have like your NPH and your chronic subdural asthmatic. Yeah. Dementia. How you can actually check for the PP. Excellent. So I think Dr. Greenblatt's bringing up the point of, you know, there it's a head CT is imaging, but it's very non-invasive and will show a good amount of things. Um, and just highlighting, we've met him in clinic, and all of the information we've gotten so far, we can obtain in clinic easily. But we need to start making the decision of, like, is he appropriate to go home and we follow this work up, out, up as an outpatient, or does he need to come into the hospital? Like, the decision to admit. What would your, you know, it is, it's a 3 p.m. on Friday. And the son says, you know, we really want to get out of here because we've got a long drive back to Colorado Springs. Um, are you going to say, great, I'll order a CT head as an outpatient, or does he need to come in? Great. Um, so I think that, again, that's always going to be very important. So I'll tell you they're completely within normal limits. Um, he's afebrile, heart rate 64. Blood pressure is 120 over 60, respirators are 18, and he's setting 94 on root air. He would definitely get up and yeah. 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 And I, I think I I agree. And I think like in a perfect world, this 79-year-old should probably always be admitted from clinic. Um, and I would make that argument based on the relative acute nature of this change in mental status. Um, if we take all things considered, this is a 79-year-old gentleman who four months ago was functioning completely independently, mm -hmm. and now in your exam room, um, we haven't done a full exam, but it's only oriented to self. Um, I think that merits close evaluation, um, and at least, and you know, potentially if you, if this was first thing in the morning at a clinic where you could get some outpatient imaging and check back with him in the afternoon, you could maybe send him home. But in the more real world scenario, he probably needs to come in for an admission. So that is what happened. Um, and I think the first thing you all asked for was a CT head, um, which I think is very reasonable. Before we do that, um, I would like to just offer a quick exam. Um, <laughs> um, so I'll say he was generally like very well appearing, certainly no muscle wasting, no um, 
uh, appearance of recent weight loss, cardiovascular exam, completely normal, no lower extremity edema, pulmonary exam, normal. Neuro exam was limited because the patient could really only follow one-step commands intermittently, um, but he appeared to have full strength in all extremities, um, appeared to have full sensation, and had normal reflexes. Um, he had normal language and that he was able to like speak spontaneously. It was clear there was no dysarthria. Um, and he wasn't necessarily not making sense. He just, he, he didn't babble like someone who is delirious, um, who is responding to external stimuli. Um, but you would ask him a question like, what's today's date? And be like, yeah, it's daytime. And later we're gonna go and have dinner. And, and he, he would give kind of almost confabulatory responses um, that were all words that made sense but weren't an appropriate response to the question or a complete response to the question. Um, and that was, that's really all in, I, in no tremor. Pardon? How was his balance? His balance, he's able to stand. He was using a walker. The sense that he'd used a walker for years because of um, arthritis. Um, and he, but he was like at a relatively brisk clip, clip, clip with his walker. You know, like the, the, especially like at Rat Clinic where there's the long hallway, sometimes you're like a hallway and a half behind the veteran. Like he was, he could beat you to the door if he really wanted to. Um, so get up and go is pretty quick as well. Um, yes. Sorry. We should do one other thing. Just yeah. This is probably one of my soapbox topics. I love it. Soapboxes are good. Well, it, can we just go to the, the move stupid and make sure there isn't anything we can feel? Yeah. Um, and let that focus our examination a little bit. And then same thing for the labs. Yeah. So, you know, like palpating for lymphadenopathy. Like we don't always feel thyroids particularly well. I'll admit that in the ICU. Yeah. Uh, but this is someone who needs an actual neck. Yeah. Um, and he did get a good um, lymphadenopathy exam and kind of lump bump exam. Um, there was no cervical lymphadenopathy, no axillary lymphadenopathy. Um, abdominal exam was benign, um, didn't appreciate a hard or enlarged liver, enlarged spleen, normal but active bowel sounds, um, and no um, inguinal bumps or lumps either. Yeah. Absolutely. I figured you did it, but I just know I don't want to gloss over it and find it on a CT. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You always feel silly when there's like yeah. in, <laughs> numerous and large cervical lymph nodes um, on the CT neck. You're like, ooh, that. Any asterisk? Asterisk. Great. Uh, and he, that was challenging because he was not great at maintaining his attention or following commands, and that was a combination, but it didn't seem like it. He just kind of would hold his hand up and put him down, but there was no black. No rashes, right? No, um, and the son said he's like, I'm sorry, I don't know for sure, but prior to all of this started, hadn't complained of any to the son, and on the skin exam now does not have any. So he is inattentive, yes. sounds like. Yeah. Okay. And he's not just pleasantly sitting there allowing things to happen around him. He, he generally is. Yeah. Um, he's not lashing out. He's not violent. He's not trying to get up and go, except as you get closer to the end of the visit. Um, yeah, he's relatively pleasant. What do you, what do you think of Dr. Johnson? Well, I would just, you know, like, is this, um, more delirium or is it dementia? And like, you know, the inattentive makes it sound more like a delirium or like more of an acute insult rather than, um, just like Alzheimer's that's progressing or something like that. The story, it, I know I missed the story, but it sounds like it's too acute for that anyway. But, um, and then I think, for me, oh, and no, like, cogwheeling, no rigidity, sounds like very mobile. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, oh, did he get, like, a heel to shin or anything like that? He did. Uh -huh. um, and to the extent that he was able to complete it, it was normal. Like, okay. he, he gets his leg up there, down the shin and back. He, the best he did was, like, mirroring someone. Yeah. And there weren't, there was no clear, like. Gotcha. And, um. Like it's that, like the, his speech pattern reminds me of um, like neurosyphilis. I know we have a patient right now, but it sounds like his gait's not wide based and they didn't notice any like pupillary issues. Yeah, excellent. Well, so, and I think this is an important time to, time, time to talk on as we're like moving from outpatient workup to an inpatient admission. 
for a more acute mental status change um, to talk about kind of the, the definition of dementia. Um, so do you, other than Dr. Johnson, um, do you guys know what, um, how DSM-5 defines dementia? And from the son's perspective, he real, really feels like it started with those mild things he's wondering now. He's like, maybe I was repeating things more often even before that. But yeah. it would, it kind of progressed and then progressed pretty rapidly. Right. Like he didn't start falling until a couple weeks before he came in. And now it seems like he's falling every other day. Um, so it's much more of a progressive than one point in time. Um, Same with attention then? Because it's got a big dividing factor attention and awareness piece. Yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah, all of it seems to have come together. Um, and so the DSM-5 diagnosis um, criteria for dementia are having a significant cognitive impairment in at least one domain. So learning and memory, language, executive function, complex attention, perceptual and motor function, or social cognition. So just one of those. Um, I, I feel like almost all patients have more than one, but recognizing as just one, um, that is acquired with a significant decline from previous functional status. So again, he would, so far he's meeting these criteria. Um, the deficit must interfere with independence in everyday activities. Again, for he certainly meets that criteria. He was previously completely independent and should not be attributable to delirium or the least helpful part of the definition, not better accounted for by another disorder. Um, so that's where I think, again, highlighting the need for an admission for this patient um, and a need for a judiciously thorough workup um, in order to understand, is this some, you know, is this a rapidly progressive or previously missed dementia or is there another underlying cause um, for this patient? So. I was thinking about that. Does that I mean, you think about this more than a lot of us do. Is, is, does that make you think more like delirium, more like dementia, as you sort of see the whole thing laid out? Um, well, I guess it's like hard in this patient because he has probably features of both. Um, because like inattention really, to me, does sound like delirium, which like you can have a rapidly progressive dementia with a delirium on top of it from all these falls, trauma, things like that. So it's like, I think it is kind of still a little undifferentiated. Great. But it does sound like there could be an aspect to rapidly progressive dementia. So um, let's get this um, CT head. That sounds good. I'll make Sneha stop sharing. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Now I can share. Okay. Um, let's see. Hopefully, we'll just will. Okay, let me. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, just, I had to get a new computer, and apparently, I have not uh, let. Zoom share of screen yet. Um, oh, lock. Okay. We'll brag on the new computer. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> money. No, I uh, poured a water <laughs> bottle on my own computer. Um, it was. Back to for his money. Uh, it was uh, not. It was not a volitional thing. <laughs> Turns out computers are not waterproof. The <laughs> Is anyone waterproof? No. <laughs> I'm just going to have to be better with it. Notice there are no beverages. <laughs> and I can't even blame my child. It was entirely my own fault. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you blame your child. She wasn't even at home. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Um, okay, so and I, uh, obviously there's a lot of imaging for this patient. Um, but let's start with the CT head. Um, I apologize, some of these videos are rather quick. Um, I'm happy to scroll through them after I play them if they are faster than is helpful. Um, this one is uh, an appropriate speed for me. Uh oh. 
What are what do you guys see? And I can keep playing it. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly how it was read. Um, I think, especially as uh, Thomas was highlighting, in the setting of multiple falls, it's really important to get the CTI, make sure there's not some bleeding or trauma. Um, always important to think about like a vascular dementia and maybe some like rapid strokes or lacunar infarcts that are leading to some of this. And there's nothing acute, no acute infarcts here. Um, I really just, yeah, look for anything that's bright and completely out of the ordinary. So um, now he's come in, he got his CT head. What other information do we want about this gentleman? And what are the next things on our differential that we need to rule out to either call this dementia or continue working up? Can we get labs? Yes, we can. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and let Sneha take back over. Um, so his BMT was completely normal. All electrolytes are normal. His blood glucose <coughs> is 112, and his creatinine is 76, which is best you can tell his baseline. Um, LFTs are also completely within normal limits. Um, Albion is 3.5, and protein is 5.9, so not like excellent, but for 79, doing well. CBC, normal. Um, he has a hemoglobin of 14.5, normal platelets, MCV of 86.6. Um, what else do you guys want here? UA. Pardon? A UA. A UA, great. Um, and that was unremarkable. No protein, no glucose, no ketones, no glucose, no nitrites. It's like PSH, P12, RPR, Excellent. So B12 is 360, which is normal. TSH is 1.5. Um, RPR is negative. HIV. HIV. Excellent. I think this is that's so. I will highlight both the HIV and the RPR. Um, technically, depending on the guidelines you look at, they are not recommended in all populations. However. I, I would perform them in any patient I can imagine seeing with a new, otherwise undifferentiated and unexplained altered mental status. Um, they could be a really good explanation. You're already poking them, um, and there's no other way to find out. Which, which populations are they not recommended? Like, who's not at risk for a sexually transmitted disease? It would, like, depending on the guidelines, and I have to look at which um, society got societal guidelines, but it's in someone where you have a high suspicion of dementia. It's not, okay. it wasn't recommended. And I like, I, I took strong issue with that. Yeah. It's um, a very narrow population of people who could not have one of those two things. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I can't really think of anyone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even those who are, you know, there's always, there's always ill things in the world around other people. So. Yeah. 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 Uh, no. So I would highlight that I, I agree with that. So, and then, in this gentleman, what about infectious workup or LP? Do we need to do it? Should we do it? Yeah. The son thinks so, um, and let, it, it, he's had he has enough old records at the VA. He seemed to follow with the CCP regularly that it, it seems appropriate. Um, do you have any risk for like prion infections at all? Like having TJD? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. We are starting to get to the point of either this is a kind of not otherwise specified rapidly progressive dementia or we're looking at rare causes of uh, cognitive decline and cognitive change. And so what would you guys, what would you think of as risk factors for prion disease? Cornell transplant. Yeah. Having a cannibalistic society. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, I, there's a great NPR, I think, This American Life, talking about the prevalence of Huntington's in the incarcerated population um, because it's just uh, related with the disinhibition. Um, but he and he has he's relatively old um, for a completely new presentation. It's very rapid, and he has no family history of dementia or other cognitive declines that would be consistent with that. But really good question. I think getting back to the LP, mm -hmm. probably would be an LP patient. 
Um, I mean, if we got your own money, that might be sure that the agency or the team is ready to support that. Yeah, exactly. And that was the thought process for his LP precisely is acute bacterial meningitis is almost certainly not the cause here, um, unless it's a very... Let's even just say it's not. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can't think of what bacteria is causing it. But absolutely, any kind of aseptic meningitis would be reasonable. Um, so on his LP... Um, would, you, sorry, yeah, please. would you want me to get an MRI first because your MRI findings can be impacted by the SLM? So I've heard this before that there can be like some slight inflammation on the MRI if you do the LP first. So often you want to do the MRI first and then get an LP. Do you guys agree with that? Or those that are kind of emergency, like if the MRI is not full normal and just showing volume loss, then like what are you going to find on the LP? Yeah, and also the LP basis. So I've I've heard both arguments. Um, in my, yeah, to me, it's living in the real world. What can you get done? Um, and so the initial approach was to like try and get the MRI first, and that was not possible. Um, and they were not going. They weren't going to like delay care for 48 hours while they got an MRI and not do an LP. Um, so they did the LP and then they did an MRI. Um, and I think the part of the thought process was too is. Apparently, it's a fairly specific pattern of inflammation from the post-LP. And so they could say, like, if that's what we see, we attribute this to the LP. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's something different, then we'll be concerned about other etiologies. Um, I think that's totally, yeah. And I think to your point, most of the things, Carla, you're naming are, are not inflammatory on an MRI. Um, I mean, they may have, some do have some specific inflammatory patterns, others don't. And so I think those two things are probably exclusive. And the LP, I think the things that it, it mimics are some of the aseptic type infections that you're going to look for anyway, or meningeal spread of cancers, which at this point would be pretty low. Um, and I guess you can always put extra fluid in two, three, and save it for psychology. Afterwards, might be the, the middle ground. When did he start the sertraline? Sertraline, he's been on that for years, years yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, excellent. And because uh, we didn't, we kind of brushed over some social history. Um, just to be thorough, he's a former smoker, quit at least 20 years ago. Um, he has social alcohol use, but the son is the only one who would be buying alcohol. And he says, we just haven't, don't have alcohol at home, really. Um, and so he, there's no way the patient has bought it any recently. And um, as far as any collateral, he's never had a drinking problem or other substance abuse. Um, so getting the initial um, LP, the, um, so the cells per microliter are 34, um, lower or upper limit of normal is five. Um, with 85 for glucose, upper limit of normal is 70. Um, protein is 90, upper, upper limit of normal is 40. Um, and the differential on the whites is 85% lymph, normal is 80%. Um, what, do you, what does that highlight? What thoughts does that lead to? Any, uh, I guess we have that, any like TB risk factors? Yeah, absolutely. Like the pleiotic. Theocytic lymphocytosis, easy yeah. for me to say. Um, excellent. And um, we have talked about like no foreign travel. He's never been incarcerated, never been homeless, um, and no known exposures to TB. Um, I will go ahead and just jump that he got a quant as well as um, AFBs that were all negative. That glucose is 85 to his reassurance. Yeah. And were there red cells? Well? No, it was champagne. Nice. Who did it? I did not know. <laughs> <laughs> it was in LA. I'm just happy I got all of this much from the VA. So. Um, the other reason why I asked that is because HSB and cephalitis yeah. yeah. have red cells as Yeah, absolutely. And that, so that would be a perfect, like, because the HSV titers on the CSF are going to take time to come back, I think. We're waiting for them now when we're nearing at least 24 hours. Um, so they, they do take some time. And if you have 
no other thoughts and you can't get the MRI, the poor man's like, this is at least an increased suspicion compared to other etiologies. Um, I'll tell you that the VZV, CMV, EBV, HSV, HIV, uh, and HTLV, um, the human T cell lymphocyte um, virus, were all negative on his LP. Yes, CSF, BDRL. Yes, that was negative as well. You get an autoimmune encephalized channel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, since that's going to take a while to come back, yeah, I think. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to belabor the MRI teaching points, um, and we will incorporate MRIs in future um, talks. But I want to highlight um, just a brief review of MRI physics. Um, it, you basically use the giant magnet to align the protons in, in whatever tissue you're viewing. And then if you're saying it's a T, T1 versus T2, you disrupt that alignment and at a regular interval measure how um, the protons return to their normal magnetization. Um, T1 is generally more of an anatomic scan, looking at are all of, all of the bits and pieces you expect there. Um, and T2 is more likely to evaluate for pathology in general, specifically inflammation. It relies on a slightly longer time period, refraction period between the disturbing signal and recording the signal. Um, so for him, we looked at a T2 because we'd already had a CT head. He also got the T1 that was normal. Um, and the T2 had um, an increased signal in the right temporal lobe with bilateral and the bilateral hypothalamus with patchy microvascular disease of the subcortical white matter. Um, and right greater than left punctate diffusion um, limitation in the palm. I don't know if that means a whole lot to any of you. It's The thing that stands out to me is it's in a lot of different places that aren't necessarily immediately connected in my mind and also not connected to his like clear symptoms that we're seeing. Um, so this is the point at which, if you hadn't already, we call our neurology colleague. Um, and they had such a beautiful description of their thought process for this. Um, they, I, I, again, was very appreciative of the note. Um, so, and, uh, I guess, no, because it's only Seha and I, Dr. Steve Lanino, who was one of our co-interns, um, took care of this patient and, again, did a wonderful job. I saw him yesterday and had to Again, um, congratulate him for that. But he <laughs> describes that um, this pattern is very reassuring against any um, acute bacterial encephalitis or meningitis, reassuring against nearly all causes of viral meningitis. At this point, they didn't have the VZV back, um, but that's the one you can have endothelial vascular VZV in the yeah. CNS. Um, that that can kind of be this polymorphic distribution. So that was a thought, um, as well as limbic encephalitis. Again, the pattern doesn't completely fit, but he's outside the range of patterns fitting. Um, a vasculopathy or um, CNS lymphoma is a great mimicker and always a consideration. So what, and I'll tell you the autoimmune encephalitis panel like a week and a half later, it comes back negative. Yeah, no, I figured. Um, it's just fun to send. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mayo some um, so we have clear, I think like the first one points were certainly work of, of dementia and new acute altered mental status. Talking about imaging and how we evaluate um, and respond to imaging. Now we've reached this point where we have sent every test we can think of. Um, we have some focal imaging findings, but we don't have a, a, a diagnosis yet. What do we do? Who do we talk to next? Um, I'll tell you, this gentleman is in the hospital and he, he's stable, but his mental status is not improving. Um, he remains oriented only to self. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and there they didn't find anything um, immediately. And I'll tell you, we got a diagnosis a different way before anything from cytology returned. And I'm assuming too on this panel they have like a myelinated protein and an MRO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Biopsy. Biopsy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Do you want to explain what you're talking about? Though? Yeah. Oh, so um, that's part of the whole acute inflammatory demyelinating all neuropathy, which is the worst diagnosis in the entire world. It makes no sense to me. But I know that part of the panel for it is anti NMO and anti um, or myelinated protein, and um, that would have made the diagnosis of in that that would be tied to some of these weird lesions in different mm -hmm. places too. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think it's a good point there. Somebody say a test like that and people just sort of nod and say, you know what the hell that is. But, yeah, right, I mean, yeah. we are looking for, we're looking for chronic inflammation, right? I mean, we've got, we've got lymphocytes, we've got 35 white cells, we've got somebody who's got a, a acute and steady decline over a relatively short period of time. I mean, so there's, there is a cause of inflammation in here, uh, which is not all of the things we were talking about earlier. And so this is where we have to say, huh, how do we test for CJD? Like, did I ask if he hunts and he's, you know, more wild meat. We haven't done some of those things. Uh, again, it's going to be a bit of a shotgun at this point, but I think we need to miss none of those inflammatory things. So. Yeah. And just a point that I learned at TH a couple months ago, um, when looking for the inflammatory panel, sometimes you think this could be perineoplastic or it could be autoimmune. There's no reason to actually send both of those because the autoimmune panel encompasses everything on the perineoplastic panel and that's about it. That's really helpful. That was a D8. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's a sent out, though, it's probably all the same. Yeah, it's all the same. Yeah. Like, um, excellent. And so, yeah, the, the point when, after talking to neurology and watching him clinically stable with re, very reassuring lab values, negative infection workups, but a clear decline from baseline. Um, the decision was made to discuss with neurosurgery, and that was actually how he ended up coming to the U, and he did get a brain biopsy. Um, and I want to highlight for this patient, because we talked explicitly about how it sounds like dementia, it, it, it moves like dementia in a lot of ways, absolutely, but the acute decline from his functional status and the fact that there were no focal neurodeficits, I don't want to say, but there were no there was no clear pattern to the cognitive decline that fit um, was really what drove the neurosurgeons um, to complete this biopsy. Because I think this is certainly not what we would do for 999 out of 1,000 patients that come in with dementia. I um, that last line of the definition that you, that you sort of highlighted, which is related to other cause, like we yeah. have other cause. Yeah. We don't and, know what the hell it is. But. Exactly. And I think uh, a potentially reversible cause in like, knowing his function beforehand because if it's like this super sick guy anyway yeah like you kind of you might think about pumping the brakes a little bit yeah and that was also part of um, neurosurgery thought processes there you know like he's been with us here in the hospital for this point it was like five days he's he's clearly physiologically other than something going on in the central nervous system in good health um and there's no reason to expect we couldn't recover good health, if not, and it's also very reasonable because it seems in line with the patient's goals of care um, to pursue at least a full evaluation of this. Um, so they got a brain biopsy, and it gave... How do they go about doing that? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, what are they eating for? They the whole yeah, so that's what I thought at first, because it seems like that would be something really invasive. Like, I um, my feet. But they actually do have to do a craniotomy. Yeah. Oh, wow. So this is okay. not a like this, it's, which also speaks to a large part of the reason why it's not standard of care in dementia <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, So he did get a craniotomy um, with a brain biopsy that gave the definitive diagnosis um, almost instantaneously on microscopy. Um, so I say how wants to stop sharing, I'll share. Um, yeah, leave you in suspense. And I'm not saying that this is necessarily something that's going to scream to any of you. Oh, no. Classic. Um, so, so the pathologist looked at this, and this is um, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. A lot of purple. 
Yeah. That's all I can see. Um, so this is what Dr. Lenino so eloquently described as the great mimicker um, and always a consideration. Um, and so it's a very, it is a very uncommon cause mm -hmm. of anything ever, really, um, which is why it was not the point of this case. The point of this case was to talk about how to approach dementia and other diagnoses, but now I can't resist. Um, so small lymphocytes and leptin meninges. Um, again, I think the highlight here is that it is primary to the CNS without leptomeningeal spread. Um, and uh, we talked about this already. So primary CNS lymphoma is an uncommon variant of extranodal non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It accounts for about 4% of primary CNS tumors, um, generally diagnosed in the 20s to 60s, like middle decades. Um, so he is on the edge at end incident. It's equal between men and women. Um, the greatest risk factors are immunosuppression um, and autoimmune conditions, of which he really didn't have any. Um, his greatest risk factor is just age. Um, as eventually, if you stay alive long enough, something will happen. Um, and the, I think the interesting thing to highlight here is the pathogenesis. It's not fully understood, but if you remember, um, CNS does not have lymphoid tissue. Um, and it's also immunologically privileged. So this, and the thought, and almost never does primary CNS lymphoma metastasize. Um, so the thought process is this is actually um, a non-Hodgkin non lymphoma from elsewhere in the body that somehow gains access to the CNS and then takes advantage of that immunologic privilege. Um, because it, it then, if the rest of the body was able to identify and eliminate the malignant cells through appropriate immune mechanism, but this one cell got far enough before it got caught and then causes the problem. Um, the presentation is very, um, is varied. Um, however, it does typically present with symptoms localized to the CNS and no systematic evidence of disease, which is exactly what we saw in this case. 70% um, do have a focal neurologic deficit. This patient, the only thing that he intermittently developed was a flattening of the left nasolabial fold. Um, and that was, it was, there was debate among neurology if that was actually related or unrelated. Um, a good majority, though, do present with neuropsychiatric symptoms, um, like this patient. Some have in evidence of increased intracranial pressure, many with seizures, and some with ocular symptoms. Just a good reminder that your eyes are a part of your CNS. Um, I feel like I don't always think of them as such. Um, but yeah, I think, not, not saying that we need to put primary CNS lymphoma on our differential, um, but recognizing when to work up dementia further, uh, and how to appropriately complete that workup. Can you tell me about rates of that one? Is it, is, was his accelerated course pretty consistent, or do you think maybe that like, circling for a longer time, maybe it was more vigilant and recognized? That's always a challenge because this, you know, as with all cancers, like it's been there for a lot longer than you're aware. Um, they do think that it's has an, a relatively indolent course for a while, but it's rarely caught until that acute um, acute decline period. Um, I, I don't think it's common enough that there's a great illness script for the rate. Is there treatment for this? Or? Yeah, so you can undergo, he went, uh, did first line immunotherapy that didn't have any effect and then um, is on immunotherapy, but has decided to pursue hospice through the VA. Um, he's in a bad age group. I mean, the, the, the treatment for this is you need to reconstitute your immune system. Mm -hmm. So if it's HIV, if it's transplant, you can adjust things. Mm -hmm. If you don't have it for that reason, it becomes a little bit hard to get at. Yeah, but a really interesting case. Um, I think also, like, things that we don't often see or think about. I don't think many of us have probably missed this, but um, 